And welcome back to the, the world's greatest adult Sunday school Bible study as we continue our continuing Bible study series on the names of God. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I, as I mentioned, I've been enjoying this, uh, going through various names of God and learning more about him on a more personal level. As I mentioned once before, you know, nicknames are kind of a growing up. Yeah, we we don't normally carry nicknames too much into adulthood, but some people do. But nicknames tell you a lot about a person. Maybe not always very accurately, but you know, if you hear someone called tiny, usually they're not. Um, but nonetheless, nicknames help us understand you know a little bit about a certain person. And learning the names of God help us to know God in a much more personal way. And so far in this. Bible study series on the names of God. We've come to know God as Elohim, which is God, Yahweh, El Elyon, the Most High God, Adonai, being Master, El Roy, the God who sees me. And a couple Sunday mornings back, we also studied El Shaddai, the Almighty God. Now, of course, we took a break. We had uh, um, a Palm Sunday and, of course, a Resurrection uh, Sunday morning lesson over the last few weeks. Um, but this Sunday morning, we will pick right back up where we left off, and we're um, studying a new name of God, which we'll find in Genesis chapter 21, verses 22 through, uh, actually, the name of the God will be in 2133, but to uh, understand that name of God, we first have to read the rest of the Bible study, uh, Bible story, which starts in Genesis chapter 21, verse 22, and it's going to go through 32. Genesis 21, 22 through 32. <clears throat> give you a moment to find that it shouldn't be too hard it's matthew genesis um, something like that right um, genesis pretty easy to find uh, open it up and you should be there now 21 verse, uh, chapter 21 verse 22 god's holy word declares and it came to pass at that time that abimelech and fico the chief captain of his host spake unto abraham saying god is with thee in all that thou doest now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me nor with my son nor with my son's son but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abimelech said I wot not who hath done this thing. Neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it, but today. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? And Abraham said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Wherefore Abraham called that place Beersheba, because there they swear both of them. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up, and Fico, the chief captain of the host, and they returned unto the land of the Philistines. Now in this Bible story, Abraham, through the blessings of God in his life, had grown into a rather rich and, and powerful man. As such, his neighbors grew concerned, scared, if you will of what someone as powerful as Abraham could do to them. So Abimelech and his number two, Fico, approached Abraham seeking a peace treaty. Now I have to, anyone here remember the Dukes of Hazard? And every time I read this name, Fico, I'm reminded of Roscoe P. Coltrane. Um, I don't know why, that's just what comes to mind. So if I say Fico a little weird, that's why. It just it pops in like that. It's out of my control. I, I can't control it. Um, but Abimelech and his number two, Fico, approached Abraham seeking a peace treaty. And Abraham ended up making a covenant with Abimelech. And that's a good thing, you know, making peace with our friends. There's a good lesson right there, but that's not the lesson of the day. Um, but, you know, we come across a lot of people in our lives, some friendlier than others, and some pretending to be friendly, but you just don't know what's going on as soon as you turn your back. But it's always good as a Christian to represent the love of God and Christ in our lives, and we show grace and mercy to everybody. And my wife and I were talking about this. I just left a company behind 
Um, and like I said, I started a new job uh, this, this last week. And every time I leave a job, uh, I bump into former employees and they're always super nice. I had another guy stop me at Wally World yesterday thanking me. Uh, I haven't seen him since probably about 2015 at the latest. Um, so it's been a few years, but he remembered me and he was thanking me for kind of helping him to get where he is today. I haven't seen him in seven years at least, so um, I don't know what I could have done, but he remembered me and he was thanking me. But there are people along the way that they, for whatever reason, they choose they don't want to like me. Well, that's their choice and their loss, of course. But um, uh, I'm not going to, as I left this previous company, there was a very toxic employee that I was okay leaving behind. But as is uh, the case that last week, suddenly she became very nice to me and I wasn't going to treat her, you know, with any type of disdain. There was no reason for me to do so. I know she's a snake and I'm, but I'm not going to, you know, stomp on you know, her head or anything. I'm still going to treat her with the love of Christ, even though she treats us badly. We are commanded to do that, if you remember. So I like here the example that Abraham sets. Abimelech is not necessarily being the nicest guy, but uh, Abraham, showing the love of God, establishes a covenant, a peace treaty, if you will, with Abimelech. But it is in the next verse, Genesis 21, verse 33, where we find this morning's name of God when Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba as a symbol of their covenant. And then what did Abraham do, it says? Well, in Genesis 21, 33, and Abraham planted a grove, we're talking about the um, tamarisk tree, in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So this morning's name of God is El Olam, the everlasting God or the eternal God, if you prefer, God of eternity even. This name helps us get to know God as the God of the past, present, and future. The name Olam reveals God, <coughs> excuse me, my throat is acting up, so for the the newbies in here. Um, this is my wife's world famous internationally acclaimed home brew. It's, it's magical in its uh, medicinal powers. I'm going to need to be sipping on it uh, this morning. I <clears throat> Just on a quick note, anyone who doesn't believe in the power of prayer, let me tell you a funny story real quick. So my wife, she's not from around here. Everyone else already knows that she comes from a tropical island paradise near Australia called Republica Democratica. Wow, my throat's really acting up. <coughs> Republica Democratica de Timor Lor Rosai. And when I first I met her when I was in the Foreign Service, we moved up to D.C. And for the first time in her life, she was exposed to just a massive amount of pollen that her body was not used to. So she's had allergies as long as we've been here. And... Um, so I, I've been praying uh, for her and uh, that God would take the allergies away from her. But in my stupidity, if you will, I, I, not really bargaining with God, but I said if it's any easier, you know, just go ahead and give me the allergies. Well, um, I have very few allergies. My biggest allergy is I'm allergic to needles because every time they stick me, it hurts. Um, but beyond that, I don't have allergies until about two weeks ago when suddenly my wife stopped having allergies and I started having them. About a year or so ago, I had a, a bad bout of uh, kind of an allergic reaction to something. I don't know what, but for the most part, I, I've never had this type of allergy, uh, allergies for you know at all. But now she's clean, and here I am, um, battling allergies for the first time in my life. I'm, I'm not taking anything for it except for my wife's home brew, which is really good stuff. It's just tea, by the way, um, just so you know. But it has special um, items in it that make it better. Apple cider vinegar, um, calamansi juice, uh, and uh, um, manuka honey. Uh, from Australia and New Zealand on that one, and the calamansi from Thailand, uh, or the Philippines, one of the two. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, though, <clears throat> the name Olam reveals God as the eternal, ageless, and perpetual God who does not change, even amid changing times. Now, this is a really good thing, because we live in a time when society is constantly changing 
and not necessarily for the better, but changing for the worse and in a steep decline. And morals are changing and declining as well. However, this name of God lets us know that God never changes and will never lower His standards. Meaning that if He said it in the Bible, whether it be 2,000 years ago or 4,000, it's in His holy word, it still applies today. I know a lot of so-called Christians today and modern Christianity as a whole decries that, well, God didn't mean what He said, or you know, it doesn't apply today. I'm telling you, according to God's name, El Alam, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His Word doesn't change. He doesn't change. If He said it was a sin back then, it's still a sin today. Just saying. I don't even know where my notes are at this point. Y'all got me all excited here. But the name El Olam reminds us of what God says about Himself in Malachi 3.5. I don't care how y'all pronounce it up there. It's Malachi to me. Um, but in Malachi 3.6, God's holy word declares, <clears throat> For I am the Lord, I change not. Not I change over time or, or I... I I'm a temporary God. No, He changes not. Again, His Ten Commandments, they don't change. You can change the words of God's Holy Word all you want, but His Holy Word doesn't change. It's no longer God's Holy Word when you start picking and choosing what part you like and what part you want to change. That's not God's Holy Word. That's your unholy Word. We stick to God's Holy Word here. And El Olam is the powerful awesome, unchanging God of God's holy word. <clears throat> this does not mean that God is not capable of change. Rather, it means that he chooses not to change. See, a lot of times people will say that um, he's not capable. He's fully capable. God can do anything. But why should he change? He's already right. He's already holy. There's no reason for God to want to change. God has the power to change if He wants. But just like how the same musical instrument can be played in different keys and different ways, so our unchanging God may work in our lives in an infinite number of ways. And sometimes we may not always understand the way that God works in our lives. But His ways don't change. His will doesn't change per se. God has a plan for you and for me, and that plan remains the same. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ. Not ambassadors for rock concerts. Not ambassadors for pastors or preachers. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ. Meaning, everything we do should be representing who we represent. Who is that? It's Christ Jesus. So we should not be living lives representing the world we should be living lives representing the Word. And the Word became flesh. And who is that? Christ Jesus. Amen. When things happen in our lives that we may not always understand, we should do at least two things. First of all, we need to realize that life is a test. In Genesis chapter 21, Sarah asked Abraham to get rid of that slave woman, Hagar, and her son Ishmael, who was Abraham's a son by Hagar. Now, Abraham may have been surprised when God instructed him to listen to what Sarah told him in Genesis 21, verse 12. I'll read this for you in case you don't know how to read. Just joking so you don't have to flip around as much. <clears throat> in Genesis 21, 12, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now we may think that this sounds a little bit cruel. Now, by the way, Sarah was asking him to get rid of, as I said, get, get rid of these two. You know, I don't care that he's your son. Get rid of him. Get rid of that woman that I told you to sleep with. You know, Sarah seems to forget who did this. She started this whole thing, and now she's like, get rid of these people. I don't want them around. So Abraham was stressed. God told him, don't worry about it. Just do what she says. You know, wife happy, life happy, right? So he, he tells her. 
So he does that. He gets rid of them, just sends them away, not get rid of them like what we think of in you know, mafia um, uh, parlance, if you will. But, but why do you think that God would allow him to get rid of those two people? Simply put, life is a test. Because you see in Genesis 22, Abraham is about to have his faith in God tested <coughs> by being asked to sacrifice Isaac his only son of promise, the son whom he loves. Now think about this. As a father yourself, can you sacrifice your own son? That's, pretty, that's a, an amazingly difficult request. Now think about this. Sending Ishmael away was preparation for the ultimate test of Abraham's faith. If Abraham still had Ishmael around when it was time to offer Isaac, Maybe, I'm not saying that this is the way it would have gone, but maybe he might have thought that even though he lost Isaac, he still had a son in Ishmael. Thus, the offering of Isaac would require much less faith and have much less meaning. Both of them are his sons. His firstborn, Ishmael, if he's still around, could serve as a buffer, if you will, of his faith. From Abraham's perspective, God's command probably felt at least somewhat unfair. Again, this was the son of promise for which he had prayed and waited so long. But the same is often true in our own lives. However, when we know God as El Olam, we can trust that God has a good reason for everything that he allows to happen to us in our lives. But only when we know God as El Olam can we understand <coughs> what God revealed to us in Ecclesiastes 3.11. <clears throat> so as a little background, <clears throat> I am a combat veteran. I was exposed to chemical weapons in Iraq that scarred my trachea. So my throat acts up anyway. So if my allergies act up, which my wife's allergies, I should say, when they act up, <clears throat> It really messes up my throat. So my apologies uh, if I uh, have difficulty speaking. Um, but in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God's holy word declares, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. This does not mean that God makes every horrible act beautiful. Rather, God does make beautiful things come out of bad. Consider what God's holy word declares in Romans 8.28. We all know this one. They even made a song about it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Not our purpose. His purpose. <clears throat> And we remember the words of Joseph. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. I love that. Because around us, there's a plenty of evil. All around us. It seems to emanate from that place they call Washington, D.C. And it spreads around from there. But there's an old saying, Don't judge the road God leads you down until you get to the end. You see, we may not always be able to, able to understand why God allows us to endure certain hardships in our life until after it is over. <clears throat> so just remain trusting and faithful even during the bad times. <clears throat> Excuse me. Never judge the road God leads you down until you get to the end. In Genesis chapter 21, verse 33, Abraham called God El Olam, the everlasting God. And then in Genesis 22, verse 1, we read how God tested Abraham. See, we know that God is about to ask Abraham uh, to do as a test, but Abraham didn't know it was a test at that time. God told Abraham to take his only son Isaac, whom Abraham deeply loved, to the mountain range of Moriah. And God commanded Abraham to sacrifice him there. We see in Genesis 22, verse 2, and God said, Take now thy son thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there <clears throat> for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. <clears throat> Excuse me. Did you note how God called Isaac Abraham's only son? Ishmael was Abraham's son through Hagar, but Isaac 
is the only son of promise. And but for their sin, Ishmael wouldn't have even existed. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2 is the first time, by the way, that the word love and the phrase only son appear in God's holy word. Abraham's love for his only son, whom God asked him to sacrifice, is a picture of a future event that did not take place until more than 2,100 years later. And I think you know where I'm going here. In John chapter <clears throat> three sixteen, Christ Jesus described that event for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, when life seems unfair, we must realize that just like what Abraham went through and so many other um, just heroes of the faith went through, life is a test. So again, <clears throat> don't judge the road that God's leading you on until you get to the end. We have a tendency to sing that song, Why Me, Lord? Of course, Why Me, Lord? sounds bad until you hear the rest of it, but this the phrase, why me, Lord? Why do I have to do this? Why do I got to go through this? Well, I can tell you, anything we go through here is still much less painful than what Christ Jesus went through for us. Amen? <clears throat> After, once you realize that um, life is a test, then you must learn to rely on God's promises. Another passage that gives us great insight into the name Elolam is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, Elolam, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth, he, <clears throat> he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. And we all know this verse. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Many of us can probably quote that verse um, without ever even having to look at a Bible for years, and you probably still can quote that verse about waiting on the Lord and renewing our strength and soaring like eagles. <clears throat> However, we should understand the context of this verse. When Isaiah wrote those words, the Israelites were very, shall we say, upset because the Assyrians had already captured many bordering nations as well as the northern kingdom of Israel and much of the southern kingdom of Judah already. During that time, the prophet Isaiah <clears throat> preached against making alliances with pagan kings rather than trusting God. So Isaiah reminded his people that God is El Olam, the <clears throat> everlasting God. <clears throat> you and I, we are locked in time. We only know about the past and the present. Because of this, sometimes we may get scared and may even make some bad decisions, um, or if you will, costly mistakes. However, because God is the everlasting God, He never faints or gets tired, and He never grows weary. And then Isaiah declared that we cannot understand God's wisdom or God's ways. Life may oftentimes be confusing for us. But guess what? Life is never confusing to the everlasting God, the creator and founder of life. When life is confusing, we need to remember this fact that God is not in the business of explaining. Rather, God is in the business of sustaining. That is why we have what promise? Found in Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast, <coughs> cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. When we cast our burdens on the Lord, he does not explain. He simply sustains. God's holy word never promises us that God will explain our problems, but it does promise that God will sustain us in the midst of them. As George Mueller once said, difficulties are food for faith to feed on. 
I like that. Difficulties are food for faith to feed on. The key words in Isaiah 40, verse 28 through 31 are faint and weary. They occur seven times in these verses. So God is speaking to the faint and the weary. Have you ever felt faint and weary? And when you do, see, God knows it and wants you to know that he is El Alam, the eternal, everlasting God. He is more than adequate to meet your needs with supernatural strength. The secret for supernatural strength. You want to be called like Captain Roy, Captain America. Uh, the, su- the secret to supernatural strength is to know God as El Alam. God eternal, the everlasting God. If you do, <clears throat> then you can experience that truth we just read in Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run... and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. The key verb in this verse is wait. Wait is what faith does. Faith always waits. God gives us a promise in God's holy word and then tells us to wait. But we are not to just sit around doing nothing, you know, wasting time. The Hebrew word translated here as wait contains the idea of hope, a hope that empowers us while we wait. The real question is, when life seems unfair, are you willing to wait on God? Are you willing to let God set the timetable and then live according to God's timing? God wants us to learn the value of waiting on Him. Waiting is valuable because that is when we actually use our faith. The Christian life is not a shortcut to an easier life. It is about faith that renews our strength so that we can live for God when life is tough. If you wait and hope in the Lord, your strength will be renewed every day. When we are waiting on the Lord, we're not sitting around doing nothing. We are reading God's holy word. We are praying fervently. We are still serving God in the ministries. We're waiting on God's answer or God's solution. Whatever it is we're waiting on, we're not just doing nothing. We continue serving faithfully and living for Christ Jesus faithfully. If you are willing to wait on El Olam, God eternal, he will enable you to fly like an eagle and run without tiring and walk without quitting during your wait. As a result, you won't quit or give up on God when life seems fair, uh, unfair. When life seems unfair, remember you must realize life is a test and then rely on God's promises. He's the unchanging God. If he said it, he will do it. El Olam... <clears throat> is the everlasting and eternal God. And I, for one, am glad to know that while pretty much everyone and everything around us is constantly changing, and as I said, usually for the worse, I am glad to know that El Olam never changes. I cannot imagine <clears throat> what it's like to follow these False religions of the world that worship dead people or unstable false idols. The promise of stability in an unchanging God is a promise worth believing in. Imagine, you know, I'm not going to name any one particular religion, but especially those that worship dead people. What is the hope? I don't understand that. I have a living God who never changes. They serve a dead person. And even one so-called Christian um, denomination serves a dead woman they might throw the name of jesus in there every now but they're still serving a dead woman you go to their little phone booth to to you know talk to a woman in a dress and what does he tell you to pray to a dead woman that's not christian i don't care what you want to call it it ain't christian um but i can't imagine that you know serving un you know these these unstable false gods we serve an un changing God Uh, I I don't know about y'all but I love that if I were to summarize this name of God in one Bible verse it would be Malachi 3 6 for I am the Lord I change not yeah 
yesterday, today, and forever. The promises of Christ on the cross and the resurrection are just as solid today as they were 2,000 years ago, and they're going to be just as solid 2,000 years from today. I don't know when Christ is coming back to take us home, but I know that he said he's coming back to take us home. And God never changes, so I know that he is coming back to take us home. And until that day comes, we will continue serving El Olam, the God who never changes. Several years ago, I asked a man if he was a Christian. His answer may have surprised some people, but it made perfect sense to me. I was just telling someone about this. He replied that he was not a Christian. He was a Catholic. Now, that's one of the few times I've ever heard a Catholic actually answer that correctly. Catholics ain't Christians. We know that. <clears throat> but usually they will pretend to be. Kind of like the, the morons. I mean, Mormons, they call themselves Christians as well, but they don't serve Christ either. But many people falsely claim that Catholics are Christians, but the reason that they are not, or the reason that this is a false claim, is because they do not worship Jesus as the Christ and do not believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. Rather, they worship Mary, their so-called Queen of Heaven, the Mother of God. And that's with a little g, because she ain't mother of anything um, God at all. Um, but they believe in salvation by works, along with the Pope, along with the Catholic Church rites and sacraments. To call someone a Christian who does not believe in Jesus as the Christ is to call them by a wrong name. Just like calling God by the wrong name would be wrong as well. That's why it's important to know the names of God and what they mean and how they can help us in our Christian walk. And I have to ask you do you trust the everlasting God in your life now that you know who El Olam is do you trust God the way Abraham trusted the everlasting God we remember how that test ended up praise God he was faithful God stopped the sacrifice it wasn't about the sacrifice it was about Abraham's faith and Abraham proved faithful that day he trusted in the everlasting God. Do you? Do you trust in the everlasting God? Even when God may ask what sounds impossible, I can promise you this. I said this earlier. If God promises it, God will do it. And that's in your life as well as in God's holy word. And of course, because God changes not, God also still desires to see each and every one of us in our rightful places next Sunday morning as we continue our continuing Bible study series on the names of God. Brother Priest, will you?